Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 265. So, today's show. I have a guest on the show, an amazing guest from uh, the other side of the pond. Uh, This guest is a foodie. This guest has a fairly well-known dad in the paleo sphere and we'll find out whether she finds that a good thing or not i know sometimes it's like no leave my dad out of it i'm paid for my own way or yeah my dad's awesome yeah let's bring him into it who knows we'll find that out in a minute um devin sisson hello hi i'm so happy to be here with you <laughs> do, do you mind the fact that people sort of bring up your dad mark sisson who's the author of um is it Mark, is Mark's Daily Apple? Yes. Yeah. Do you, do you mind that or do you almost try and break away from that association? I think I got into some of this to start to break away from it. And I've realized just how much help and support he offers me throughout this process. And frankly, I'm proud to be Mark Sisson's daughter. Who wouldn't be? So I love talking about him. I love bringing him into all of this. And he didn't work hard to take this all for himself. Brilliant. Oh, amazing. Well... We're not going to talk about Mark, we're going to talk about you, because you're here on the show, and um, I have been doing lots more, obviously, research on your work today, and you've got a fascinating journey, which I want to delve into. Um, Firstly, I think I'll let you kind of quantify what you do, so if someone's in an elevator and they say, Devon, what do you do? What do you say? I put a big old smile on my face and I say I'm opening up a restaurant and I just published a cookbook and I sort of let them ask around from there. Oh amazing so what because that's obviously very two different things you if you look at uh, opening a restaurant and a cookbook kind of a cookbook is almost putting yourself into the big wide social media space trying to do the kind of internet sort of thing and then a restaurant is on the ground in a town local community do you want to have those two sides to your business or are you moving one into one more than the other? What's kind of the path for you right now? I think I'm realizing how much my intention in doing both of them sort of intersects and where one, the cookbook might be centered towards um, a more personal in-home experience and then the restaurant is sort of out there, objective for the community, for the globe, hopefully, eventually. Um, but my intention in all of this is to really just expand and help to grow this community, this health movement of uh, people that enjoy moving their bodies, nourishing their bodies, and just getting in touch with what it means to be healthy. And I think I'm doing that on a, on a, on a smaller scale with the book and a larger scale with the restaurant. One's a little more personal and one's a little more community-oriented, but I think they they line up really perfectly with one another, and I look forward to sharing about my experience in the restaurant for the next book and I look forward to talking about my book at the restaurant. So you brought up a great word which is healthy and I don't think it's quite used enough in the fitness space as we talk about abs a lot and you know the gym and that kind of stuff. What what does health mean to you? So it's interesting because in opening the restaurant we discussed as a team to to not use the word healthy to not tell people that it's a healthy restaurant, but instead to use the word clean eating restaurant. Um, And to me, I understand that because I think a lot of times when you say the word healthy, people immediately go to vegan or eating weird foods or things that don't taste good, whereas clean eating offers a more like natural, organic, fresh kind of uh, air to it. Sure. So healthy and clean to me, um, what I've realized in this journey is that it's entirely subjective. And that even though my father is a leader in the health industry, um, what's working for him and his followers doesn't work for everybody. And that's okay. Mm. And even writing this book was about discovering that even if I wasn't going to do what my parents were doing, what my dad teaches, that I could still be healthy in my own right and I could still inform people on how to find their own innate health, which, you know, which we all have inside of us and being able to get in touch with that and not telling people how to eat or how to live, um, but just that to pay attention to it. So 
one thing I love to explore on this podcast is the journey. The journey that's got someone to where they are and has given them the passion and the drive to share a particular message. Mine was going from obese to being a slim man and how that literally changed my life. You have had a certain journey that has obviously revolved around food and the kind of experience and the enjoyment. Talk to me about almost your journey with food and it's probably started at quite a young age and how that maybe went through kind of a disordered phase and came out into a healthy phase which has got you to where you are now. So take as long as you want and talk to me about that journey because I'm fascinated. We can talk about that all day, so be careful what you ask for. (laughs) Um, I remember as a child always having healthy food in the house. You know, at the time that was a lot of, unfortunately, soy products, but a lot of organic things, a lot of products labeled natural. Um, I never had sugar cereals. I didn't taste soda until I was 15. We didn't have candy. Um, So when I went to other people's houses... I saw Girl Scout cookies and Oreos and Lucky Charms and all of these things that I didn't have at home, and I sort of went crazy. I think I abused the privilege of going to other people's houses. I ate things and explored things, and at the time didn't realize how they how they felt in my body afterwards. Um, and it wasn't really until I went away to college, actually, that I started paying attention to food. We always had good quality food in the house, um, but they were never... It was never my responsibility to choose what to eat or how to make it or when to eat it. And when I moved away to college, 3,000 miles away from home, it was really my first chance to start to take ownership of how I was going to feed myself. And I would grocery shop and think, am I really buying these things because I enjoy them or because they feel good in my body or am I just buying them because what it's what I would have grown up around, what I'm used to and what, what mom and dad says is good for me. Hmm. Um, and it was at that point that I started trying other things. It had been, you know, probably eight to 10 years that my dad had sort of been in the paleo thing. So I was just not eating gluten because we didn't eat gluten and I wasn't really sure why, but I didn't seem to question it. So I enrolled in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that program, but, um, like I said before, I did so to get away from my father's way of life, my father's way of living, and to just figure it out for myself. Um, I didn't realize that in doing so, he, he's in the promo video for the program. So I wasn't totally getting away from it, but it gave me an opportunity to learn about every single dietary theory, lifestyle, and essentially how to become a health coach. So there was a period of time throughout that program where for a week we'd learn about being a vegan, and then a week vegetarian, a week Ayurvedic, a week high fat, low fat, you know, we went through everything, and at a certain point, I just felt like food was poison. Everyone was giving me mixed messages, mixed signals, I wasn't sure what to eat, and I sort of became scared of food, and I spent uh, a year exploring each of those dietary theories and lifestyles because I figured if I was going to write about it or tell other people to do it that I should have gone through it or experienced it for myself in my own body Um, and that landed me in a place of just feeling extreme guilt for eating a kale salad that had a little too much olive oil on it or fearing that I wasn't getting enough protein or being worried about how much sugar I was craving or did I eat too much? Did I not eat enough? And food was just this source of anxiety for a couple of years, actually. It was hard for me to eat in front of people. It was hard for me to feel good about what I was eating, even though I was making objectively clean choices. Um, And that messed up my digestion. It's really hard for your body to digest food when you're constantly secreting cortisol and your body's in fight or flight mode. I had stomach issues for years and I couldn't sleep well at night, thyroid, adrenals, my menstrual cycle, everything sort of was off balance. And at one point my dad looked at me and he was like, can you at least start drinking bone broth or something? Something's not working for you. Mm -hmm. So I had a doctor's appointment, you know, all of my levels were off according to, you know, the doctor at the time. And I got so disheartened because my intention in this journey was to try to find a healthy space for myself, 
was to try to do myself good, eat better, and be able to share that with other people. And in doing so, I sort of swung too far in the other direction and wasn't enjoying food at all. And what I've come to realize now is that food is a source of enjoyment and pleasure and community and relationship and fun, creativity for me. So I... There was a period of time where I just threw everything out the window and the pendulum went a little far in the other direction. I ate whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, which wasn't serving me either, but I sort of needed that to feel both sides of it so that I could now, in the last year or two, come to a place of what am I eating, why am I eating it, how do I choose to move my body and what feels right for me, and that's what I'm focusing on right now is... um, getting rid of the rules, still using the scaffolding that my dad has provided, that blogs and experts and science provides me, um, but really tuning into my body. I don't need to work out seven days a week anymore. And if I want to work out every other day or three or four days, and it just really listening to myself and honoring my body when I get to the gym and I'm just tired and I don't want to be there, so I go home. Or allowing myself to eat certain things despite that voice in my head that says, ooh, but this is not enough greens for this meal and remember how much protein you had earlier. But to just like, just be. Mm. To just be. There's going to be an awful lot of people that will listen to that and love it and respect it but not be able to do it. And to be able to listen to your body is an incredible thing. Where or what processes do you believe people have to go through to be able to trust themselves to actually get to a place that you're at? Because people are going to need some help to quantify and be able to latch onto that themselves. I'm not there. Okay. And there is there is no there. Mm-hmm. It's a constant, it's just a process, you know, it's not the destination, it's the journey in getting there. And whatever I learn about myself along the way is helping me move in that direction. But there is no there. Um, what I have been asked a lot is where do I start? Yeah. And my response time and time again is you start exactly where you are. Wherever you are in your understanding of your health and your mind and your body and your nutrition, that's exactly where you start and you let that be okay. You haven't been doing anything wrong. Um, there's nothing that you needed to do better or you should have done differently. You start exactly where you are. And more recently than that, I've asked people to sort of go through their, their day, whether for them that's their family life, their spiritual life, their work life, their uh, eating habits, their workout routine, or lack thereof in any area, um, and pick out what makes you happy. What do you enjoy doing? What feels good? For me right now, what feels good is almond butter. Mm -hmm. Almond butter feels good. Did not feel good last week. It might not feel good next week, but it feels really good right now. Spending time with my dog. Um, You know, it's kind of cliche, but I love a good bubble bath. Like picking out the, the times during your day where you feel calm, where you feel open, open to a level of wisdom and peace that just allows you to be. And for some people... Those are few and far between. And pick out those things and just do those things more often. Do the things that make you happy more often. When you're in a place of good feeling, when you're in a place of calm, when you're not running your thoughts in your head at 100 miles a minute, you'd be surprised what sort of wisdom is available to you in listening to your body. And it doesn't come when you're rushing to work. It doesn't come when you're speeding through a workout. It doesn't come when you're, you know, get feeling guilty eating a pint of ice cream on the couch. And it doesn't come when you're not enjoying your salad for lunch because you think you should be eating healthy. It comes in those very small, brief moments throughout the day where you're able to just quiet your mind. Mm. And whether it's somebody dealing with an eating disorder, an unhealthy relationship, trying to lose weight, get fit, gain, you know, whatever that may be, you know your next step. I don't need to tell you what to do. You don't need to tell them what to do. You can read any blog, any book, watch any news channel, and everyone will tell you something different. The only person that knows exactly what next to do for you is you. And for some people, what to do next is to seek out help 
or assistance or a support system. Mm. But you're only really going to know if you spend more days, more time each day doing things that make you happy. I think a big problem there, though, is people feel guilty. Guilty for being a little bit more selfish. I think society breeds that we must do a lot of things for other people. And while that is true and people enjoy giving time to other people and helping, people legit feel legitimately guilty for taking an hour for themselves to, like you said, have a bubble bath or go for a walk or anything that's going to make them healthy. And I think, one, there's that initial component. And secondly, people have generally a lack of self-worth for their their own happiness and actually don't believe they have the right to be happy and potentially sabotage parts of their lifestyle to stop that really ever happening that's kind of a bummer isn't it that's really sad but it's sad it's true though so to to answer your thought or to answer your question you don't no one's asking you to take an hour out of your day. We don't, we don't have an hour out of our day sometimes. Sometimes it's three minutes. Sometimes it's 30 seconds. Sometimes it's less than that. And sometimes it's 10 seconds out of time, out of your time, out of your day. And it can be in the car. Get to work a minute early. Stay at the gym and a minute. You know, what, it doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be a commitment. It doesn't have to be a huge chunk of time. And you don't even have to do it so much as be aware of those moments where you are in that feeling, where you are in that good feeling place. One of the best analogies when people are feeling guilty for spending too much time to themselves or selfish or that they should be spending more time helping other people is sort of the airplane analogy. Whenever you get on an airplane and they go through the, all the safety instructions, they always tell you put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if you don't have your oxygen mask on, you're going to pass out before you can help the person next to you, and then you're both passed out. No one got helped. It works the same way in life with energy, with connection, with communication, with happiness. What's actually selfish is that we're not helping ourselves or other people when it might just take a few more moments each day to literally put our own oxygen mask on so that then we can go out and help 10 times as many people Mm -hmm. to be that much more powerful, to be that much more present, to be that much more available for others. Because that is selfless. It is not selfish. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Um, But I think we should segue back to food. So your book, Kitchen Intuition, has come about throughout this journey. And there's obviously something, there's a key message that you want to get across to how people behave in the home, around food, in their kitchen, and that connection with food. What are some of the key principles in the book that you're trying to teach people in terms of just being at one with their food and being comfortable with it and not having an anxiety about literally what's going in people's mouths? I have a quick question for you. Do you feel like a lot of your listeners experience that or a lot of the people you talked about talk about or talk to just this inherent anxiety around food i think there is probably a clear divide and i could be wrong and it's just what i see in fitness there's a group of people uh, and i would be one of them that see food as quite a functional thing like i would be someone that would eat for purpose over pleasure And I put the right things in my body because that makes me perform well as an individual. And there's other people that have a deep emotional connection to food where it brings them comfort. It brings them enjoyment. And if they are not emotionally strong, then that can become a negative thing because they end up overeating and finding deeper comfort in food when really that was not the answer. So I think in my experience, that's where these kind of two pass and people struggle to amalgamate those two sides and find a really happy and pleasurable medium. So something I noticed about food is that it's incredibly social. And if you think historically, it's how the family comes together. It's how a village or a tribe or a community comes together. Think of every holiday we all celebrate. It centers around certain types of food eaten at certain times with 
either family or friends or the community, certain groups of people, and food is incredibly social. And I 100% agree with you. My father is one of those people that eats food because it's fuel and he's trying to optimize his performance and the use of his organs and his body and his mind and everything like that. So there are two different types of people. And in my opinion, my dad's missing out on the joy of food. But uh, on the other hand, I, I envy his carelessness about it, mm-hmm. like his care, but also his carelessness and that it's not a thing for him. And it sounds like it's, it's quite similar for you. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. So can you repeat your question? Sure. So if you like... I think so you have a different perspective on food to your dad and I'm going to I'm going to kind of generalize and maybe sound slightly sexist who knows but I would say naturally men seem to fall a bit more into that category of seeing food as functional and women see it a bit more as enjoyment uh kind of the home uh the social aspect and kind of I suppose really where a lot of people want to be is in the middle so that there's no kind of negative on either side and we accept and use the positives of both thought processes because it sounds like you're still a little bit in your camp and your dad's still a little bit in his camp and we need to create this person in the middle. But it's like at the same time, he's, he is doing what I'm, what I'm preaching is sort of this intuitive eating, but intuitive eating for him is, is finding his his truth from science, from research. And he is going what's with what's true for him, but I could also pull up a, a Google article in, in 10 seconds that says that um, being a vegan is the best, the best possible thing for your body and will optimize performance and will uh, decrease inflammation and doing all these things that he's intending to do right now. He is using his intuition. He is thinking about it similarly. He's just accessing um, science and research and the internet and his own experience. And I'm just doing it in the kitchen with like sweet potatoes versus broccolini. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Sure. So we all we all absolutely want to be there. And it's interesting you say that about men and women because I, I would I would tend to agree. Um, but my my boyfriend is not one of those men. He is absolutely one of those people that we talk about, you know, we're eating breakfast and we talk about what we're going to make for dinner and how that's going to make us feel the next day and how it's something that sort of combats what we did the day before and this is the type of exercise we did so we should be fueling our body in this way. So it's very much from a, like, a scientific intention, but at the same time it's something we, we connect over through, around, emotionally and I guess my answer is that it's still possible to to take this approach, this intuitive approach, um, with either side, and you're doing it too, Mm. just in your own way. And that's why I say wherever you are is the place to start, and wherever you are is okay. Now, if you came to me and said, I really want to have a different relationship with food, and I'm just using it as fuel fuel right now, and I don't enjoy it, and we'd have a different problem. Mm. But you're okay with the way you approach food and health and your body. And how you do it, why you do it, when you do it, doesn't matter. It's how you think about it. And if you are on the same page with yourself in that matter and not fighting it, so to speak. So that is really where the problem lies if people are not being honest with where they're at and where they want to be. And it's about bridging that gap for people. Like my approach is right if it works for me and your approach is right if it works for you. But when there's a disconnect, that's when we have a problem and that's when we need to go on a journey to fix that or help that situation. Absolutely. So with, with the angle of your book, would you say, and I haven't read your book, you know, I've only sort of looked at, you know, the initial research that I did and stuff. Would you say that your book is kind of um, part recipes, part education, part this is my story and this is kind of where I want you to be with food in the home? Yeah, except for the last part. And the f- one of the first parts of my book I write about, like, look, I'm not here to tell you anything. All I'm asking of you is to challenge yourself. All I'm asking of you is to try to become more aware and take responsibility for your health, 
for your thoughts, for how you're feeling. And my method of doing that was sort of getting in touch with all of that in the kitchen. And if whoever that resonates with, that's great. But but take responsibility for, for, for who you are, how you're feeling, what you do throughout your day, and how you conduct yourself in life. Because at the end of the day, you're all you have. And you're the only person that can help you. And so this book was written for people that are struggling with those things or just love to cook and want to learn a few more tricks and tools. But I'm realizing how much more this has to do with just asking people to step up, to become aware. I'm not asking you to change. Just realize that what you're doing is creating the results you're getting, whether you like them or not. I um, I actually don't want the show to go on because I want to leave people with that thought that you've just laid. I think that was uh, fantastic. Um, I'm a huge fan of just showing people the potential that they have. And it sounds like your book, although its approaches with food, is about giving people the power to go their own way with it and just develop the skills that they need to develop to get to the destination that they want to be at. And like, like it's a destination at the moment, and like you rightly said, you never get there. This is all just a journey. I don't know all the answers. You don't know all the answers. You're still searching. I'll keep searching. And that is just the beautiful thing about health and fitness. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, um, Devon, where can people find the book? I'm assuming it is on the Amazon machine. The Amazon machine it is. Um, do you guys have Barnes & Noble there? Is that a weird no, question? No, that, that's, that's a U.S. thing. Okay, I'm glad I asked. I'm glad I asked. But if any of you are in the U.S., Barnes & Noble for sure. Definitely Amazon and uh, on the Primal Blueprint website as well. Amazing. Um, there's a link on Mark's Daily Apple. And you can, of course, follow me on Instagram at Kitchen Intuition. Uh, where are you also on Facebook and Twitter? Uh, I don't Twitter. You don't tweet. I oh, no. don't Twitter. No, nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Facebook. I don't know if I'm too old or too young for that. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, yeah, I I have a personal Facebook and working on a, a website. Um, I didn't didn't quite want to do the whole blog every day thing while I'm opening up a restaurant. Yeah. Ten mi- yep. minutes from my house, but eventually that'll be the case. Um, and hopefully, you know. Book number two will be a thing. Mm. Well, uh, everyone that's listening, uh, please go and uh, explore the book. See if it's right for you. Um, it's called Kitchen Intuition. Uh, follow um, Devon's work on Instagram is the place, Kitchen Intuition. Uh, Devon, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, being able to speak to you. I think you're an incredibly balanced individual. I think you're very refreshing to the fitness industry. And I wish you all the best. I think, uh, I'll be honest, I think amazing things are ahead of you despite the work of your dad. I think the way that you present what you have learned and what you want to teach other people is fantastic. So thank you. Keep sharing your message. Um, I look forward to seeing what you do in the future. And good luck with the, good luck with the restaurant. Crazy. Thank you so much. This was, this was really good and challenging for me. Again, like I said before we started, I learn something new about myself each time I do this kind of thing. So I really, I appreciate your questions and, and your time. And I, I look forward to the future and hopefully I can meet you in person one day. One day. Yeah, um, hey. definitely. <laughs> uh, right. Everyone that's listening, we have ho- I hope you've enjoyed the show. Um, please uh, show us some love on the social space. You know, retweet it when you see it. When you see it on Instagram, say something. Um, Devon's Playground is Instagram. So, you know, tag her into some stuff, say some things, say what you've learned, you know, and again, Devon's putting herself out there. If you want some tips off her, if you want to learn, then just ask away. That's why we put ourselves out there. Anyway, that's a wrap from me. Devon, thank you again. Thank you so much. And I will see you all next week. And in the meantime, stay awesome. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 264. 